everyone and welcome back to SALT Talk. My name is Rachel Pether and I'm a senior advisor to Skybridge, a global alternative investments firm, as well as being the MC for SALT, a thought leadership forum and networking platform that encompasses finance, technology and politics. Now SALT Talks is a series of digital interviews with some of the world's foremost investors, creators and thinkers. And just as we do at our global SALT conference series, we aim to empower really big, important ideas and provide our audience a window into the mind of subject matter experts. Today, I am very excited to be speaking to Saeed al Masrui. Saeed is the Deputy Group CFO of Mabadra Investment Company, one of the world's largest sovereign wealth funds. Before his current role, Saeed was seconded from Mabadra to spearhead the launch of the Debt Management Office within the Abu Dhabi Department of Finance. During this time, he led more than $30 billion worth of transactions, including a $10 billion joint venture between the Russia Direct Investment Fund and the Department of Finance. He sits on the board of several companies, including, but not limited to, Abu Dhabi Commercial Bank, SAPSA, Abu Dhabi Future Energy Company, Cleveland Clinic Abu Dhabi, and the Abu Dhabi Pension Fund. Saeed, welcome to Salt Talks. Thank you for having me, Rachel. Pleasure to be with you. Now, I severely truncated your biography, and I apologize for that. So maybe let's just start by, tell me a bit about your personal background and, and how you ended up in your current role at Mabadala. Uh, maybe in short, uh, uh, I guess you have, uh, you, have, uh, you have given a good brief on, on my bio. My name is Saeed Mizroy. I have been with Mubadala actually since uh, uh, 2007. A few years after Mubadala was stop, started in 2000, uh, 2002, I started my career in the investment banking uh, side here in the UAE for a couple of years before uh, joining Mubadala. And then I joined the acquisition team. It used to be called the acquisition team uh, back in 2007, worked under the leadership uh, uh, of Hani, who is also uh, uh, today the executive director of Mubadala Capital here in, in, in Mubadala. Then uh, I decided after a few years uh, uh, to change my career uh, for a new opportunity, as you mentioned, uh, to move to Department of Finance on a second basis to establish the debt management uh, office. Uh, in 2009, with the, with the global financial crisis, it was really critical and important for the government uh, to establish an office that will be the window for all debt issuances for the government, as well as managing the rating of the government or the sovereign rating with the rating agencies. We have done a done couple of issuances for the government, but we were also lucky at that time in 2010 and 2011, we saw increase in oil prices at 110, 120. We, uh, we, we pivoted the focus more uh, into uh, uh, looking into special projects here in, in Abu Dhabi. And if you would recall on the back of 2009, we had a couple of uh, credit situation and insolvency situation, either on the banking industry or on the real estate, uh, side where the, the government uh, needed to actually to intervene with these uh, with these entities. I had the pleasure at that time uh, to work with the chairman of Department of Finance on these couple of projects, uh, and we were very successful in providing funding and liquidity, uh, either on the banking side or also on the real estate sector, which were large sectors for us at that time uh, for the Emirate of Abu Dhabi. Excellent, and I, I want to come back to the points about the debt capital markets a little bit later on. But you obviously work for Mabadla now, which is one of the world's largest sovereign wealth funds. It's not your typical sovereign wealth fund, and we can go into a bit more detail on that later. But we have quite a geographically diverse audience on the call today. So for the benefit of those that might not know so much about Mabadla, could you give a, an overview of its investment strategy and focus? Of course. I always try, I mean, Mubadala is a very complicated organization, uh, but let me simplify it maybe for our audience into Mubadala development company and then Mubadala 1.0 and then Mubadala 1.2.0. Uh, so Mubadala development company was established back in 2007 and that goes all the way to 2017. And the purpose of Mubadala when it was created at that time, uh, we had Abu Dhabi Investment Authority, which was at that time the largest sovereign wealth funds for the government of Abu Dhabi. And uh, it's, a, it's a fund that focuses on financial investments and drives all their investments based on asset classes, um, uh, diversification or asset classes 
uh, uh, strategy. The government in 2000 and 2002 uh, were looking for someone who can build businesses, build sectors for uh, for the Emirates of within the Emirates of Abu Dhabi and for the UAE economy. And the main purpose was at that time is to create an economic diversification with sustainable uh, uh, jobs. In 2002, uh, we had the first great project for us, which was Dolphin. Uh, in 2002, you know, uh, energy resources sources was critical for uh, for us when it comes to power um, as, as an energy security for us. Dolphin gas pipeline have helped and support the government of Abu Dhabi to actually provide enough gas supply for, for the power sector. And that was an iconic, remarkable project for us. Also, I can give other few projects there where I believe uh, have been uh, uh, a key milestones that the government of Abu Dhabi as a shareholder of Mubadala was able to achieve. Um, the leadership here in, in Abu Dhabi, we're looking for uh, um, uh, a world-class health uh, system or world-class world health organization that can actually uh, help and support the UAE national to be treated in, uh, in Abu Dhabi or in the UAE vis-a-vis giving, uh, taking them abroad either to Europe or, or North America. And the vision is how can we have that world-class healthcare facilities in, in Abu Dhabi. And uh, uh, the launching of that was basically how can we partner uh, with CCAD, uh, with, with Cleveland Clinic in, in the US by having CCAD or Cleveland Clinic Abu Dhabi here in, uh, in Abu Dhabi. Uh, what's really interesting now, after a few years, after opening uh, a Cleveland Clinic, we have seen high quality uh, uh, feedback from uh, individuals and patients, either from Abu Dhabi or the region, uh, that basically uh, the vision that was said that instead of people traveling abroad and getting uh, uh, that uh, high quality healthcare services to be delivered to them in Abu Dhabi, and we were able to achieve uh, that vision, and we continue to improve on that. Uh, on recent transactions or recent uh, initiative that we came up with, especially on the technology side, I think uh, it's becoming uh, uh, a hot topic, especially with uh, what Mubadala have been doing either with vision funds or the direct investments that we are doing on the technology sector. And I guess we will touch base on that uh, uh, in the coming few minutes is Hub 71, where we're trying also to build an ecosystem in the Emirate of Abu Dhabi. How can we help entrepreneurs? How can we help uh, uh, venture capital to come and to establish uh, businesses and to grow businesses out of Abu Dhabi. Last but not least, the Catalyst Fund, um, you know, the asset management business uh, uh, sector, we can grow it here in, uh, in the UAE. And I guess um, we have been trying now to deploy capital as an LP investments to, fee, uh, to, to, to give a seed capital, either for private equity or alternative investment funds, or even on the equity capital market, to establish their offices here in Abu Dhabi through a global financial market and to assure basically uh, that ecosystem develop over the year. That was uh, from 2002 to 2017. And that culture, Rachel, we care about as, uh, as an organization or as Mubadala because we want to continue to be pioneer as Mubadala, as being the entrepreneur uh, 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 organization for, for the government of Abu Dhabi. And we want to continue to create sustainable jobs and economic diversification. Uh, post the, the financial crisis uh, and 2015, when we saw low oil prices, the government started to, uh, uh, to give direction by consolidating sectors, either on the banking industry or even on the real estate side. And you would recall, uh, in 2017, there was an announcement, uh, a merger between IPIC, the International Petroleum Investment Company, and Mubadala Development Company. And here where I call it Mubadala 1.0, the Mubadala Investment Company was established, uh, where basically the government said, we have an overlap in the oil and gas sector. Why don't we create one unified window to ensure basically we don't have uh, competition from both organization and at the same time, you needed that scale to have a presence on the investment community. Uh, uh, one year later, uh, uh, it seems, uh, post the merger with IPEC, the shareholder basically realized that scale diversification is really critical and important by having a, 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 a really large sovereign wealth funds similar to, to Adia. The decision came in 2000, I guess, 2018. Basically, Abu Dhabi Investment Council 
to join Mubadala Investment Company, which is, I call it Mubadala 2.1. And that created really the large scale for us. Now we're around $230 billion company. We have created enough diversification in our portfolio, and uh, we were able to manage to create a sustainable return for, uh, for, uh, for the shareholder. Abu Dhabi Investment Council, um, it's basically uh, a full subsidiary owned by, by Mubadala. That subsidiary is being, uh, have taken the endowment business model on the last 10 years because they were established in 2000 and 2007. And their portfolio uh, is a fund of fund where basically their business or their investment strategy uh, focus on investing in asset classes through funds, through external fund managers who manages uh, their capital on their behalf. This is, in summary, what Mubadala Investment Company is. That's great. And I want to pick up on one of the points you made about that entrepreneurial spirit. A couple of weeks ago, we had Bada Alalama, head of Mubadala Aerospace on Salt Talks. And he was you know, telling this great story about how Strata had adapted their, their manufacturing line that was producing aerospace plant, uh, parts to create N95 masks and actually become an exporter. How can you give me some other examples of how some investments have adapted during the pandemic in recent times? Hey, Rich, I think my 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 view on this. I mean, post COVID nineteen, that's my uh, my personal opinion on it, and what I have heard from uh, from others through our network. I think a couple of themes that I see them going to grow over the next few years before I touch base on on Strata and other examples. Clearly, digitalization is going to be uh, disruptive across different industries, not just on the UAE, but across, uh, uh, across the globe. Working from home is something that we see it um, as a trend. And I don't think um, post COVID-19 era, people will fully come back to work because I think uh, uh, working from home have created a lot of efficiencies for many individuals who are being able to co-op with the work from uh, staying at home. And I see that a big risk on, on the real estate side, especially on the commercial side. Um, less business travels, I think that, that will have also its impact on the aviation industry. And I don't know how much disruption and reduction in, in profitability of these, uh, of these sectors. Consumer behavior have changed. And this is, will take me to one example before we touch base on Strata. As you mentioned, I sit on the board of, of ADCB, and we have seen a lot of statistics post COVID-19 that the behavior of consumers have changed from the traditional way of doing banking by going to the branch and getting their services done physically. Today, the, the, the cash transaction have plummeted to levels that we have never seen them before COVID-19. Uh, usage of credit card have have increased. Also, we have data and access to how much people are active on the application and the time that they spend on banking application. That have skyrocketed. All this gives you an indication that, that basically consumer have, have built the, ex the experience of how to use applications. They are satisfied with that customers because also we run surveys for our customers and the surveys have shown very positive signals that customers, they want to continue to, to use that. Hence, that will create an opportunity on the banking industry because remember, if there is no credit growth, you will be focusing on cost optimization and reducing your cost to income. And that at the same time, as it's being profitable for the bank, improving the return on equity, that also will reduce the number of jobs as you are start starting to, to close branches or to have branch closures because um, you really don't need all this number of branches if retail customers more specifically are happy and ready to use all these online um, uh, applications. On the retail side, I think uh, uh, the retail is going to shift completely from shopping malls to, to online. And maybe we have, we have seen it within, within our families, uh, with my wife and with, with friends that people, I mean, uh, uh, personally, I use not to, uh, uh, to shop online. Um, uh, you usually go and buy uh, consumer goods by spending some time on the shopping malls. Now you are forced to use Amazon and other uh, online applications because of the COVID, because of the quarantine, and the less movement that we um, we see. So Strata is is another good model to me that 
how how the banking industry, how the retail industry, uh, how these companies will change their business model because you really need to adapt yourself uh, to the new era. Because to me, banking, if you, we're not going to be spending on digitalization, uh, I think we're going to be lagging behind as a bank because customers are going to be demanding more technology, more applications to be, to be in place. That's what Strata, I think, uh, went for because um, yes, you are an aircraft composite structure manufacturing company, but on the long term, uh, especially if there will be a slowdown on aircraft uh, uh, purchases, uh, then also you, the supply chain will reduce um, with that uh, uh, minimal growth on, on the aircraft manufacturing uh, sector. So you really need to adapt yourself how you can pivot uh, uh, by creating a new business products or creating new projects for you, be it N95 or even um, to take a step back and to say, should I focus on uh, uh, personal uh, protection equipments uh, that uh, basically can be a new business lines for me to cover for any losses that I potentially could, um, could have from the airline industry. No, that's, um, that's really interesting. And I want to actually just follow up on something that you said previously about this, when Mabadala Development Company was more focused on economic diversification and job creation within the Emirates. Obviously, the UAE economy, I guess like most economies, have taken a hit during the pandemic. Will Mabadala 2.0 look to invest more locally again to support the regional economy, or how do you see that playing out in terms of investment strategy? We as an institution, we have been always uh, um, uh, in, the, in the centric of our strategy, always Abu Dhabi and the, Emir uh, and the UAE uh, economic diversification has been always uh, in our mind. Uh, whenever we see opportunities, whenever we see that Mubadala can play a role on that, um, we will continue to play that because um, uh, it has been always mentioned by our CEO managing director that the culture of uh, being a sector uh, builder or a business builder, uh, something that we need to continue to maintain as a culture because that's our roots and that's how we we evolved as, as an organization. As uh, maybe you have mentioned, post-COVID-19, I think data and statistics, um, uh, they don't really look good in terms of uh, uh, what numbers we're going to see in 2019. I guess uh, uh, we're going to see uh, the GDP dropping by 6 to 8% this year and maybe hopefully a potential of a growth of around uh, 3% uh, next year. Uh, as you know, the UAE GDP has two large uh, external factors that is impacting our, uh, our growth. One is uh, uh, oil prices, uh, as revenue represents, oil revenue represents one third of our GDP, and that volatility would have a significant impact uh, on, on our growth going uh, forward. Also, there are sectors, be it retail, hospitality, uh, 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 real estate sector. Um, those sectors in combined, I think also they represent one third of our um, GDP. What's really important here for us is basically um, the, the, um, the international uh, 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 traffic that comes to, to Dubai and uh, to the UAE. Uh, without this, I think the oversupply of the, of the retail or the real estate sector or the hospitality, it won't be covered by the local, the local demand. Hence, uh, uh, the programs that are being set by the government-related entities, be it Mubadala or other government-related entities in, 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 in Dubai, will have to continue to support the, the UAE economic growth by having new programs and in, in, in new industry that will basically revive uh, 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 these industries to come back post-COVID-19. Uh, one good example of that is Expo 2020, which is going now to be Expo 2021. Uh, it's, uh, uh, hopefully, uh, it's going to take place next year, but that's a risk factor also that um, if it gets delayed uh, again by another one year, uh, that is a risk uh, uh, on the UA economy because um, it's going to take out many of uh, uh, visitors uh, uh, that were supposed to plan to come to the UA. But let's see how uh, the virus will play and if we're going to see a vaccine by the end of the year. Yes, inshallah, fingers crossed. Um, I'm just interested, when you talk about Mabadala 2.0, obviously across a lot of different asset classes, a lot of different geographies, 
how do you view the world when you break it down into separate economies or separate geographies? Maybe, I don't know, let me, maybe I think, why don't I give you um, some overview of our strategy and then where you feel you want me um, to, uh, to speak more, I'm very happy to um, also to, to, to double click on specific, specific areas. But Mubadala, even pre-COVID-19, I think our strategy has two folds. Um, we spoke about the first fold, which is uh, basically the local investments. Uh, and as I mentioned, this is on the core of our strategy and we'll continue, uh, uh, we'll continue to invest on the local economy where we see it's relevant for Mubadala and commercial basis. And we will continue to support to help the economic diversification and creating sustainable jobs uh, uh, here in, in the Emirate of Abu Dhabi or in general uh, uh, in the UAE. But for us internationally, we will continue as an institution to grow and to manage our portfolio. Uh, we will continue to enhance the resilience of our portfolio and manage the volatility of that portfolio to ensure basically we achieve an acceptable risk adjusted return uh, for, for, for our shareholder. Tactically, maybe on the last 18 month or 24 month, uh, we have embarked on a strategy on specific sectors. I'm gonna come uh, to those sectors, is to look for, for specific funds within the alternative investments, either be it in infrastructure or on the private equity, where we invest with them uh, through LP investments. We have a strong partnership with them and we do uh, a lot of co-investments uh, uh, that have uh, turned to be uh, good investments for us so far on the last um, 18 months of deploying uh, uh, this capital. But maybe let's double click now into sectors and, uh, and asset classes. On the sector side, Mobadala is trying to focus on a couple of sectors. Technology, life sciences, uh, um, consumer, and financial services. On the technology side, maybe we have seen uh, our investments few years back with Vision Fund. We have direct investments uh, either in North America and our San Francisco office uh, uh, to look into investing in, 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 in venture capital, small ticket size, uh, taking a portfolio uh, a strategy by seeing what could be successful. Also, we have a fund that is dedicated uh, uh, to Europe. And uh, clearly for us, the themes there are um, you know, um, mobility autonomous is something that we see it going uh, uh, to grow and we will see a lot of capital going to that subsector. Um, robotics is another area of an interest for, uh, for Mubadala and uh, energy storage. Uh, those are the three or four themes uh, that we continue to look to see if there are opportunities. And the reason for that is um, the technology sector will continue to grow over the next uh, uh, 10 years. We see a lot of capital and knowledge going uh, toward that sector. Um, clearly, um, after, um, after post-COVID-19, uh, after we saw the, um, the market crash a few months back, uh, uh, we saw basically how the big five technology companies actually pulled uh, uh, the market to achieve levels above uh, above uh, 3,200 or 3,400 uh, levels. So that's that's an area that we will continue to, to, to invest in. Life sciences and consumers, uh, there are great themes there. Uh, those two sectors have been growing around four to five sectors, more specifically in, in, in North America. So we see really tailwinds there. The themes, a lot of consolidation because some of these sub-sectors of, uh, of life sciences and consumer are very fragmented. So consolidation is, is, a, is a play. Um, on the consumer side, disposable income has been growing in North America. And clearly we have, I mean, latest data have been showing household savings past one trillion, which is a good indicator that household have been deleveraging and having saving, deploying that on financial assets which basically it will give them the power over the next six to 12 months post COVID-19 to, to consume that. Um, so consumer spending either on services or in goods, we're gonna see something that will grow. 70% of the US GDP also represented by consumer spending. So that will continue to be the play going forward. On the life, life sciences, I think there is um, people uh, have, um, the, uh, they have the capacity uh, to have uh, uh, health insurance, 
uh, especially in North America. So spending on health uh, healthcare will continue, especially with the effect of COVID-19. Uh, also, the feasibility on the cash flow, especially with the with the investments that we have seen, a lot of feasibility and very helped a bit the margins. Those teams have really uh, attracted us to say we want to focus on those sectors that makes a lot of sense for us to uh, uh, to look at them and to invest with our partners, uh, the, PE, uh, the private equity funds. Last but not least, um, financial services. Uh, we have been developing a strategy on financial services here in Mubadala, and hopefully in the next couple of months, maybe it will be launched at the beginning uh, of, of next year. Um, it's a large sector. It represents almost 6% of the, of the global GDP. It has been growing at 4 to 5%. Um, the banking industry has been highly regulated post the GFC. So uh, what's the interest here is actually many of the banks starts to spin off a lot of their non-core assets that have an impact on their, on their capital adequacy ratios. And that's creating an opportunity for us. So for us, we're looking into investing in life insurance. We're looking for corporate brokers and general insurance. Also consumer finance, as I mentioned on how household uh, starts to deleverage and having savings, consumer finance uh, near prime is an area that we like. FinTech is a big play with, uh, with, with payments. So those are the couple of uh, subsectors that we're looking to, uh, to invest in. And the team are working on that strategy. And hopefully by the, by the beginning of next year, we see the launch of, of, of that strategy. That's from a sector point of view. On the asset classes, um, real estate and infrastructure will continue to be an attractive sector for us because of the feasibility on the cash flow and the low beta that reduces the volatility in our portfolio. Renewable is a big thing for us, especially in, in, in Mustard. I think with um, uh, energy transition, ESG, uh, those two big topics uh, that have been pushing international oil companies to shift from IOCs to become an energy company, I think there will be more renewable projects. Uh, and renewables, frankly speaking, starts to become very competitive uh, from a pricing point of view, uh, uh, and that is creating, you know, an opportunity for renewable uh, uh, projects to get a, a bigger uh, a market share vis-a-vis -vis the other um, the other energy uh, energy sources. Last but not least, from a geography point of view, maybe you have seen our investments in Asia, more specifically in China and India. Uh, be it uh, Reliance Geo or Reliance Retail and our SIP team, the Sovereign Investment Partnership, uh, uh, already investing in, 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 in China. And we like both, uh, uh, both geographies or both countries because of the GDP growth that we see, increase in wealth and wealth distribution, uh, the urbanization rate a pace that is going, uh, uh, both countries are going through, is actually creating an opportunity for us. Also, we have been very lucky and India also to, to partner with Reliance. Reliance is, uh, is a very credible partner, a large corporation, have a very successful track record and execution capabilities. And we were lucky with other financial, um, uh, financial institutions and sovereign wealth funds to invest either on Reliance Geo or uh, uh, Reliance Retail. And definitely North America will always be uh, uh, an area that we will invest in because of the size of the economy and the opportunities being created across different sectors in, in the United States. There are so many things that I would like to pick up on there, and we've already had a, a lot of questions coming in from the audience, and, and broadly they fit into some of the sectors or countries that you've just, just discussed, so I'll, I'll try and break them down accordingly. With regards to healthcare, are you mainly looking at that from a financial investment focus, or are you also looking to bring the technology or the investments to the UAE. And the, the recent um, example I'm thinking of here is Science37, the clinical trials platform. So now those types of investments, are they things that you actually want to bring back to Abu Dhabi? Is it more just a, a financial investment? See, I think we, we need to segregate be, between, you know, the international investments and the national investments we do, but there is a coordination there. So for us, everything on the international side, it's, uh, purely driven by the financial, the expected financial returns that we are going to achieve, either on direct investments, LP investments, or, or co-investments. But at the same time, uh, between you know, our local team, if they realize basically there is 
something that is really interesting and it makes sense for us to establish it here in Abu Dhabi or in the UAE, you would see that coordination between the international team who have done the transaction uh, with, with the local team to see if we will be able uh, uh, basically to copy or to paste, to, to, to reflect or to, to, to place something like Science72 uh, to, uh, to be here in, 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 in the UAE. But that's not the, the, the only example. I think there are many, uh, many transactions that we have done uh, 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 globally that uh, basically when, when we feel it makes sense and uh, financially uh, it makes sense for us to, to bring it here to, to Abu Dhabi or to the UAE, definitely uh, that creates an opportunity for us um, to partner either with the, the government or to partner with the private sector uh, uh, to launch those projects here in Abu Dhabi. Right, and I, there's a, actually a question that's come in from uh, Ken Lustig, um, which kind of ties in some of these themes and points you've just made. Uh, given your um, ownership or involvement with Global Foundries and ATIC, do you see Mabadala bringing any large-scale technology infrastructure investments into Abu Dhabi? And, you know, you did touch on sort of data centres. Do you see those, um, you know, data centres or hardware manufacturing being brought into Abu Dhabi? Uh, Rich, I think the, the short answer, if it, if it is relevant and commercially makes sense for us to bring it um, uh, to Abu Dhabi and to, to the UAE, uh, absolutely we, uh, we are going to bring it. I think we brought a lot of uh, services industries. I think technology and the industry is more complex uh, 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 in nature uh, because uh, of its uh, complexity, but generally speaking, as um, as a vision or as a, uh, as a direction for us as an institution, uh, we always try to see if there is a possibility that we can uh, replicate something here in, in Abu Dhabi or in the UAE and it makes sense commercially, uh, we will definitely bring it. Excellent. And I, I do want to take a step back actually and ask some, some broader battle questions, but just a, another quick question that's come in from the audience. And you mentioned financial services as a sector as well. Uh, is digital asset an area that you're looking at, and what is your exposure to this portion of uh, financial services? Uh, I mean, the, our exposure in general, our exposure. If I would exclude uh, the national, uh, uh, the national banks here, we own a large stake in First Abu Dhabi Bank and Abu Dhabi Commercial Bank. Our weighting on the financial um, services relative to the to the overall of Mubadala's portfolio is is very minimal. And that was the rationale behind is why we have not entered the financial services sector. And especially, it has that growth of 4 to 6 percent. It has been growing at 4 percent. Um, and there are a long list of potential transaction uh, that we see that we can execute as an institution. On that basis, uh, the team have been really working uh, uh, on this on the last couple of months. And hopefully, we would see uh, launching this uh, um, strategy on the next couple of couple in the next couple of months, maybe at the beginning of of, of next year, um, and that will touch base on uh, the sectors that I have uh, mentioned, either be it on the fintech or payment, uh, but large part of that, as we as we spoke, that uh, um, the sector itself we like it. A uh, couple of sub sub sectors of that, it's a priority for us, um, but really depending on. Um, uh, how that strategy will, will evolve in the next couple of months and what's the right um, start for us. Are we looking to do LP investments with funds and then do the co-investments or are we going to, to partner with private equity right away to do co-investment opportunities? The picture today is not clear because we're still working on, on, on that strategy. So, you know, you mentioned going into things as, a, as an LP uh, and co-investment. One of the other reasons that Mabadala isn't your typical sovereign wealth fund, and this ties back to the entrepreneurial point, is that you do manage third-party capital. You're one of the first, uh, I think, I think the only sovereign wealth fund in the world to do so. Can you talk a bit more about that program and how you see that evolving over the short to medium term as well? And maybe we talked about how Mubadala has the spirit of. Uh, trying to come up with new ideas, right? Um, and we have this uh, uh, space of 
thinking outside the box. Uh, and we don't really shy away uh, from those ideas. So uh, the team who have worked on managing uh, third party capital came with that idea. And at that time, uh, it makes a lot of sense because one, um, it will be, we will be the first one as a sovereign wealth funds to, to manage third party. But not just that, the reason, but also it validates many things. It validates your uh, uh, institutions. Uh, also, it validates your knowledge. Uh, it validates your reliability as an institution to manage third party capital. And also, it gives the opportunity uh, um, for some part of Mubadala team uh, to get to, uh, to be on the other side of the fence where uh, they're not managing uh, one shareholder money or the government money, but they manage other financial institution uh, money and they get scrutinized for uh, managing those, uh, those funds. Uh, I personally believe it's a, it's a great idea and I think it makes a lot of sense because uh, that asset management business uh, it can be grown to other asset classes and it could, uh, it's not going to become the size of Mubadala or sovereign wealth funds, but also you could sell a GP as Mubadala to other financial institutions, either from the region or international, uh, and you will continue to grow that and it could be a home growing asset management business that Mubadala or a sovereign wealth funds have created and at the same time they have investments and footprint across the globe. And I think it's always great to see how Mabadal is evolving like that. And certainly when you have that third party assessment or analysis, it's really a, a verification of what you're doing. I guess another, or sort of the initial part of Mabadal is journey into this transparency and taking on more external stakeholders is when you went to the debt capital markets. And I know you're quite active in the debt capital markets last year, obviously historically low interest rates. What sort of uh, cost of funding are you? trying to achieve and how do you look at the, the debt to equity ratio of Mubadala? So, so for us, I think the debt capital, I mean, Mubadala have started that program back in, in, in 2009. And we look at debt as a, a source of funding for, for Mubadala and managing our liquidity. You know, Mubadala managing their portfolio either through asset divestments and monetization and redeploy that new capital into a, a new investments. Also, there are government injection from time to time. Historically, Mubadala have, uh, uh, basically the government have stopped that injection a couple of years uh, ago and now Mubadala is, is self-funded. Or it comes from dividends that from the large assets that we have today, be it the world of Sepsa, Borealis, Nova, and, and, and OMV. So that for us is, is critical in terms of source of, um, of funding. Um, if you would recall 10 years ago, back in 2009, interest rate environment was different, cost of funding was really high, and we started to build uh, uh, the portfolio of Mubadala when it comes to uh, uh, fundraising. And at the same time, if you would recall also, IPIC at that time, it's independent from Mubadala and they have been doing their own uh, uh, debt funding. Um, we embarked on a strategy on the last 18 months to really benefit from the advantage of low interest rate uh, environment. So we have raised around $7.5 billion. Back in November 2019, we raised $3.5 billion. And last May, during the COVID crisis, we raised $4 billion, uh, $4 billion. And the main reason for us is to create liquidity, a dry powder for, for the organization, but also we were able to bring the cost of funding substantially uh, uh, down. We were north of 4%. Today, I think we are close around 3.5%. And we are targeting to bring that below 3%. Relative to potential retains that Mubadala can uh, uh, achieve on the future, especially on the alternative investment asset classes on a double digit uh, IRR. At the same time, the duration of portfolio today uh, is around eight, uh, eight years. It used to be around six years before we raised seven and a half billion, but we continue to refinance any expensive debt to ensure basically our duration is north of 10 years. That will give the opportunity for the different investment teams within Mubadala to have the runway and to have uh, uh, the time to deploy capital to manage those assets uh, uh, with enough time to create value for the next maturity uh, uh, that we will have on average over the next eight years or, or 10 years. So hopefully uh, we have been successful on executing on that 
strategy will continue to optimize Mubadala's balance sheet. Uh, but what's really important for me is the attractiveness of our um, our debt as, a, as an organization. As you know, we have a very close relationship uh, with the government uh, uh, as the chairman of Mubadala, as the crown prince of, uh, of Abu Dhabi, Sheikh Hamad bin Zayed. Also, we have a rating equal to the sovereign rating, which is a double A rating. We have demonstrated as an institution uh, a lot of transparency, governance, uh, transparency. We are prudent in nature. So uh, from a risk management point of view, the balance sheet that we have in terms of a debt to equity ratio is low um, teens ratio. Uh, so what that means basically relative to the other sovereign wealth funds or financial institutions, or even the ratios that are thresholds ratios that being set by, uh, by the rating agencies, we are way below uh, those ratios, which is really positive. And that have really helped us as an institution uh, to be very attractive uh, when it comes to any debt assurances. A good example, uh, in, in May, uh, in around May 2020, um, we raised $4 billion. It was um, um, almost 10 times over subscription. Uh, also, in 2019, we were able to raise $3.5 billion. We got three times over subscription. And that is, uh, for us, basically, a demonstrate how attractive uh, the, the debt issuances or the debt paper of, uh, of Mubadal. So just wanted to pick up on um, you know, some of the points you made. I guess that long-term focus, and which is obviously helpful given the majority of your assets are in the private markets. I'm interested to know how you actually benchmark the fund when you're looking at returns. How do you actually benchmark um, Mubadal if, if you do it all? Uh, I, I think there are a lot of benchmarks, really depends uh, on which sector you are in. So um, today, Mubadala started to apply uh, relative, uh, uh, relative performance uh, in certain KPIs that we have. And uh, uh, technically, technically speaking, if we take an example, um, the oil and gas sector or uh, natural resources, uh, then there are specific um, benchmarks that are being set and agreed between um, the portfolio management team and the asset management team. And uh, this gets applied as, uh, um, uh, if you wish, uh, on relative basis and based on the scorecard that's being set for, for, for example, natural sources or petroleum and petrochemical. And then you apply this across um, uh, the different 13 or 14 sectors that we have today. Excellent, and we actually, we are officially over time, but we do have about a dozen questions left. So I'm, I'm going to ask two more questions, and I want to ask one that's right in your wheelhouse, given the work that you've done at the debt management office as well. We've had an audience question coming in, saying, firstly, fascinating interview, Saeed, very insightful. Um, do you foresee a battler in the driving seat to issue in the domestic market and local currency supporting the local debt capital markets? Thank you for your question, as well. Uh, I, I am personally very keen to see the government of Abu Dhabi and the federal government to start establishing the local debt capital market. Um, this is a dream for me to see it in reality because I think the private sector, our economy needed this. Um, I believe our colleagues in, in, at the federal level and the local uh, government, they have been working on this and hopefully we see both governments start issuing that because you need that benchmark before you see government-related entities, be it Mubadal or other institutions, to come to the local market. But also at the same time, we are very cautious uh, and mindful when it comes to impacting liquidity. If the liquidity is going to be there and it makes sense for Mubadal to issue on the local market and to support the local debt capital market, absolutely we will be uh, supported. Great, thank you, Said. And you know, you've answered so many difficult questions today that I'm going to end on a nice, easy one. Uh, we have had actually a couple of people ask who or what inspires you, and please give the Saeed answer, not the, uh, not the Mubadala answer. To me, the challenge that you live in every day, I think it's, it's something that makes me uh, uh, work more. Uh, I don't think it's the title, and I don't think it's... Um, only the actual investments. I think uh, 
I am lucky to grow up here in, in, in Mubadala and to see um, the competition within the organization. It's not in the bad way, I think, as, as, as a team working together in, in a transaction to achieve a specific thing. Um, that journey that you spend either on the buy side or on the sell side, a good example for us, uh, to me, is the journey of Sepsa. We spend almost 14, 15 months from the start to the, to the finish. Uh, and you go through uh, ups and downs on, on that journey. And sometimes it works with you, sometimes it doesn't. Uh, uh, and those challenges, actually, it makes me uh, work hard, uh, push myself more beyond the boundaries. Um, and to challenge my, my team and the different teams that we are working with in, 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 in Mubadala. This is what really makes me happy every day to come to, to the office and to work with the different um, functions in, 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 in Mubadala. But absolutely, the inspiration that uh, by supporting your family and making your family, family happy, especially we're going through a very difficult time these, uh, uh, these days, uh, managing you know, kids from home, or even to give the credit to the women and especially wives, you know, uh, uh, taking the lead on, uh, uh, you know, taking classes from home and making sure kids are taking classes from home. It's very challenging. So uh, uh, this is an area where uh, it pushes me as an as a father um, or as a husband to uh, to work more and to make sure that the family is safe and uh, uh, to protect them. Well, thank you so much, Saeed. Yes, I think you do have a lot of roles to fulfill, but I think that's a very optimistic note to finish on. And from my side, I just wanted to thank you so much. It's been such a pleasure. Richard, thank you. Thank you. Today. I really enjoyed the interview with you.